There's an old saying that goes, if you fail to plan, you plan to, you plan to fail. The idea being that we need goals and strategies to achieve you know, the goals that we, that we want to accomplish. You've got to have goals, you've got to have strategies. Well, this evening I'd like to talk to you about goals and strategies, but not our goals, not our strategies. I'd like to review some of the strategies that Satan uses to achieve his main goal, which is to destroy our souls. If you have your Bibles, we'll, we'll put it up on the screen here, but if you have your Bibles, take them, uh, take them out to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. Peter says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Now I'm sure many are familiar with this warning and we believe it, we believe that it's true, but do we actually know what the tactics, what the strategies are that Satan uses to destroy us? We have a warning here, but we don't have the details. Perhaps if we knew them, we would be victimized less often. Perhaps if we knew them, we would avoid his traps more successfully. Perhaps if we knew what his strategies were, we, uh, we could uh, grow stronger spiritually instead of constantly you know, using up our energy, repairing our lives as a result of his successful attacks against us. In other words, if we knew what his strategies were, we wouldn't be playing catch up all the time. So let's look at three, you know, it's a sermon, three. Let's look at three most common strategies that Satan uses to destroy our peace, to cause us grief, and of course, to separate us from God. Well, strategy number one, very simple, are lies. Lies. Jesus called Satan the father of lies because he was a liar and he used lies to deceive and attack people from the beginning of time. You know, the dialogue between Satan and Eve reveals the basic kind of lies that he has used from then all the way to now. He hasn't changed the lie. It's always the same lies that he uses. Let's take a look at what he said. First of all, the first lie is, well, good is bad and bad is good. Good is bad, bad is good. This lie is contained in the question that Satan poses Eve concerning the forbidden fruit in chapter three, verse one of Genesis. He says, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? He questions the evil of the act. He's saying, is it really bad? Or have you just misunderstood? He presents it as something that, well, something could be possible. We see this today as Satan relabels what were once sins into acceptable things. Satan knows how to, you know, he knows how to do marketing. He just changes the name of things. For example, corporate greed, well, it becomes downsizing. You know, the directors and the shareholders, they want more money. And so what are they going to do? Well, we'll just downsize. Someone who's been a faithful and hardworking employee for 20, 25 years, well, we just throw them away like old machinery. Fornication, well, let's give that a new name. Let's just call it cohabitation. There we go. Um, how about sexual abomination? Well, let's, sexual abomination, that's such a buzz killer, isn't it? Sexual abomination, no fun there. Let's just call that gay pride. How about murder? Well, let's just call that productive rights. Or idolatry, well, let's just call that consumerism. Or disbelief, well, let's call that humanism or any other type of ism that denies the existence of God in trying to explain the reality of the world that we live in. 
So Satan is a great manipulator of words and uses the media more effectively to devour us with his lies than we do preaching the truth. I'm always happy to talk about BibleTalk.tv, the website, uh, the teaching website that Hal and I uh, work on. And we're always happy to say, wow, we got 1,000, 15, 2, 3,000 visitors that have come and downloaded material. We're excited about that. Until we realize that there are two billion porn sites. Until we realize that if somebody just you know, shows themselves nude you know, and throws that on the internet, that'll get 250,000 views right off the bat. Satan knows how to use the media to achieve his, his purposes. How about another lie? Another lie is uh, sin has no consequences. Now look at what he said to Eve in Genesis 3, 4. You will not die, he said, no consequences. You know, God had specifically said that if they disobeyed him, they would die. In Genesis 2, 17, if you eat of its fruit, you will not just die, he said you will surely die. In other words, that's his way of saying, don't doubt me on this one. You will surely die. This lie is always framed in the same way. Satan tells us in a thousand ways, there will be no consequences for your choices. But we know from every one of our experiences in the physical world that this is a lie. Since when do our choices not have consequences? Every action has a reaction. Every choice we make sets things into motion that will affect us in one way or another. If this is so, why would we ever think that moral and spiritual choices would have absolutely no impact on us? You know, Peter answers this question in his second epistle, chapter three, beginning in verse three. Read along with me if you're uh, out of your Bible, uh, uh, second Peter chapter three, verse three and four. He says, know this first of all, that in the last days, we're in the last days by the way, if you wonder, that's us, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed of water by water, through which the world at a time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not waiting for any to perish, or not wanting or wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Second Peter chapter three, verses three to 10. So Peter reminds us that just because the consequences of our sins, just because the consequences of our bad choices and disobedience are not always immediate, they are nevertheless sure. It don't happen right away, but don't let that fool you because it doesn't happen right away. God says the consequences are sure. The sureness of God's judgment is not based on time. It is based on God's promise in His word. If He promised there'll be a judgment you can be sure that there will be a judgment sooner or later. And what God promises, good or bad, He always delivers. If He punishes the mighty angels and He puts Satan into the lake of fire forever, He will also execute His judgment on us as well. And then there's another lie that Satan uses, often used then, used now, and that is, you know what, God is really against you. He just doesn't want you to have any fun. 
He just doesn't want you to you know, get ahead the way you want to get ahead. He's always putting obstacles in your way. He's always trying to use up your time, serving, worshiping, thinking, reading, meditating, loving, adoring. You know, he's trying to suck up your time and you've got other things to do. God isn't really for you. This is what convinced Eve. Satan convinced her that God did not want her to enjoy the pleasures and rewards of the forbidden fruit. In Genesis 3, 5, what does he say? For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, there are many variations of this, uh, very, many variations of this lie. For example, your way or your decision or your choice is really better than God's decision, God's way or God's choice. Imagine that. Or you can do things that go against God's teaching or God's commands, but actually end up with good results. For example, you can use aggression or manipulation or deception, but uh, accomplish peace at work or in a relationship. In politics, imagine. You know, the politicians, this is not a political speech, but I have to just insert this, all the politicians, all of them, okay? Right, left, center, up, down, all the politicians, they've all got ads, and every time you check the ads, you know, the fact checkers check the ads, they've always shaved the truth somehow. They've always kind of, there's an underlying thing there. It's just not rock solid true. They all do it, and yet they're all doing this while saying that their goal is to reach across and work together and be unified and accomplish good things. How are you going to accomplish good things if your campaign is based on lies? And that, again, that goes for everybody. Satan wants you to believe that God does not have your best interest at heart when he commands you to obey him, when he commands you to deny yourself certain things, when he commands you to trust him, his, his, he doesn't just say, would you trust me if you feel like it, if it's convenient for you? you know, we say that sometimes, if it's convenient for you, please stand for the song. You got a choice, you got a bad back, you got a sore foot, whatever, you can stay seated. But God doesn't kind of make a suggestion, He commands us to trust Him. Satan wants you to believe that indulging yourself and removing God's restraints and fulfilling your own needs and desires is really the better path to happiness and satisfaction. And how many people just, just bite into that fruit? They bite into that fruit. Of course, Eve believed this lie. And look what happened to Eve. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Of course, Eve believed this lie and lost her innocence and lost the wonderful garden position that she and Adam enjoyed at that time. And so the first strategy that Satan uses to devour us, to devour us is lies. Another strategy that he uses, isolation. Isolation. You know, I remember my dog, Prince, when I was a little kid, and Prince, you know, you used to like to chase after cars, but when I was a kid, maybe you're like this too, we didn't have all these laws about you had to have your dog on a leash all the time, you had to pick up after him, whatever. It was just let the dog out and the dog would run around the neighborhood and then you'd whistle or he knew where the food was, you know, he chased cars. And one day he chased a car and got hit by that car. The, the, the fender hit him, you know, but he was barking at the wheel and the guy stopped and the dog ran into the fender and, you know, we had a hard time, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a killer blow, you know, he, we could have taken him to the vet. The problem was he was hurt, what did he do? He ran under the porch. He was under the porch at the back, in the dark. You know, anybody want, come on Prince. What did he do? He isolated himself. That's a tactic that animals use. 
And animals of prey also intuitively know this problem or use this um, device in order to hunt, don't they? They pick out the weakest victim, they separate it from safety, and they attack. You know, a good example of this strategy, you know, working on supposedly a strong person, is seen in the story of David and Bathsheba. We won't read the whole passage, but let's, let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. It says, then it happened in the spring at that time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about this woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her, and when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Now we'll stop there, I think it's a very familiar story. Notice that David was the king. He was very powerful, he was successful, he was rich, he was popular among the people. One thing, however, he remained alone in the palace without his aides, without much to do, giving his military leader Joab the responsibility to go out to war. That was his responsibility. But he said, no, you go, I'll, I'll stay back, relax. Note also that the person that he sent to bring Bathsheba to him is not even mentioned. His name is not even mentioned. No, uh, uh, no name means no influence. And so that person that goes to get Bathsheba doesn't even warn the king. And so David sent everyone away, left himself isolated, a perfect target for Satan. Now, I don't know what lie Satan used to convince the isolated king. Probably that his actions uh, had no consequences because after all, he was the king or perhaps no one would ever know or perhaps my personal favorite, just this once. Just this once. You know, I spent seven years with a nasty drug habit because as a young man I said, just this once, what could it hurt? Just this one time, probably be no consequences. Maybe that's what David said. But God knew and after David had Bathsheba's husband killed and took the young widow as his wife in order to cover his tracks, he was severely punished by God. You know, isolation comes in different forms and it's caused for various reasons. For example, we're isolated because of our work or because of a, a move that we make. Or we're isolated because we, we, we've cut ourselves off from others due to disagreements or misunderstandings. Or we're alone because we're tired or we're too busy or we're overcommitted or we're committed to the wrong things or we're committed to the wrong people. I know people who commit themselves to all kinds of people but won't commit themselves to the Lord's people. Or we're isolated because of depression or loneliness, illness, hurt feelings, unresolved issues. I'm not saying that isolation is a sin. I'm saying that we are much more vulnerable to sinfulness as we are more isolated. There's a relationship between these two. We are vulnerable because our defenses are down. Sometimes our body is weak or our spirit is distracted, you know, we're busy, we're under some kind of pressure, we're not paying attention. In this environment, we are easy targets for Satan. Recognize that when you are becoming more and more isolated from God, when you're becoming more and more isolated from the church, for whatever reason, the snake is slowly coiling itself for an attack. So Satan's strategies, Lies, isolation. Strategy number three, enthrallment. 
Enthrallment is Satan's most common tactic. The word enthrallment or to enthrall means to capture, uh, to capture the interest or to hold spellbound or be overwhelmed. A lot of examples of people who were enthralled in the Bible, Lot's wife for example, she was enthralled by the pull of the city that she left behind and she looked back. David, for example, was enthralled by the lust he felt for Bathsheba as he watched her bathe. It says he saw her bathing. Last time I heard, people take off their clothes when they're bathing, you know what I'm saying? So what was he enthralled by? Was it some newfangled type temptation? No, it was just a beautiful woman's body. And yet, he allowed that to enthrall him. Demas was a missionary, a helper to Paul and the, uh, the apostle, and he was growing in his faith and service, but was so enthralled by the world that he abandoned Paul and his ministry in order to go and live and enjoy the world and its pleasures. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. This is how Satan keeps people from becoming Christians, or he causes Christians to fall away from their faith. Seduction and enthrallment. Seduction is like the pull of gravity. We all have something that is easily pulled within us. For some it's our pride, others it's greed, others is a weakness towards sex, power, whatever it is. There's something in us that can be used to draw us, to pull us towards a person, a situation, an idea or a thing. And then as we are pulled, we're enthralled. We are held captive, we are overwhelmed, we're spellbound by the thing that we're drawn to, the proverbial moth to the flame. James describes the process in his epistle in chapter one, verses 13 to 15. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and He Himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away Get it? Seduction. Carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Satan draws us to that sin which overpowers us and destroys us with it. The problem is that many times we're not paying attention or we don't care or we don't believe that we're actually vulnerable. That's where the, just this once. When I was a young man, everybody was doing it, everybody was taking dope and so on and so forth, and I said, well, just this one time, I can handle it. Seven years later, you know, I wasn't handling it. I was just a consumer. Or we're not listening to God's word, we're not listening to others who are warning us. How many times have elders called people, visited, encouraged, exhorted, and people are going, yeah, you know, it goes in one ear and out the other? Because they're not listening. They're not paying attention. They're not taking it seriously. God Himself warned Cain that he was being drawn by his anger and jealousy towards the sin of violence, and Cain ignored the warning, and what happened? He murdered his own brother. We need to understand that as Christians, we're not just vulnerable, but we are targets for destruction by the one who prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You know, the way that Peter writes that, he's not saying that we are uh, you know, in a bad place, at a you know, wrong place, wrong time, type, that type of victim. You happen to be going to the 7-Eleven at the time when a guy's robbing the 7-Eleven and you get caught in the crossfire. You know, wrong place, wrong time. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that Satan purposefully is seeking those who are in some way weakened that he may specifically attack them. You watch those National Geographic or those BBC, the world, you know, the nature shows. You ever watch how lions or cats stalk their prey? They're so patient, they're just there, they don't move. You ever watch a cat? You people are cat people? You know, a cat can just stand there, and just sit there and watch and be still and watch whatever he's watching to try to grab for the longest time. 
but you know he's focused on that thing. I, I tend to think Satan is like that. He's focused on us, he's lasered in on us, you know, just waiting, just waiting till the tipping point of our weakness enables him to come in and devour us. We need to realize that the someone that the Bible refers to can be us or someone close to us. So let's be aware of Satan's strategies for destroying our faith, our peace with God, and our salvation. Satan will use every lie to convince you to disobey God. If you're being drawn to something and you're asking yourself, well, should I or shouldn't I? Just ask yourself the question, who's talking to me here? Who's trying to pull me towards this thing? Is Jesus trying to pull me towards this? And if it's not Jesus pulling you towards that thing, well, you know who else it is. There's only, you know, it's an easy decision, one or the other. So he'll use every lie to convince you to disobey God. He will attack you especially when you are isolated for whatever reason. So realize that if you've become isolated for whatever reason, you, you have been marked for attack. And he will use every seduction necessary in order to capture your excuse me, your attention and your spirit so that you will serve Him instead of serving God. Now, I don't want you to think that all is lost, that we have no power, no resources against Satan and his strategies. In the time left, let me share just a few strategies that God has given us to succeed in our battle against the evil one. What do we need to know? Number one, know your enemy. Know your enemy. For our struggle, Paul says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul says that our true enemy as Christians is not human, but spiritual in nature. The real battle is for your soul, and Satan, our enemy, has no rules of combat. He plays dirty. You know, in the Second World War, Christmas time, the Germans would stop, the Allies would stop for a time because it was Christmas Day. You know, there was no fighting if they were you know, facing each other, for, you know, trying to gain some ground or whatever. They'd call a, a halt to it. And there were rules in war. If you took prisoners of war, there were rules in the way you had to treat them and so on and so forth. But Satan, there are no rules. There are no rules whatsoever. He'll get to you using a loved one. He'll get to you at the worst possible moment. No rules, so know your enemy. Know your enemy. Those who scoff at the reality of Satan, they do so at their own peril. We who know Christ, we know better, and we should be careful concerning His power. Another one of our strategies, know that you can win. You know, one of Satan's lies is, well, oh, just give in. You know you can't win. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? Many people believe this and they use this lie to justify their bad behavior and their bad habits. How many times have I heard people say, I just can't help it? I just can't help it. Or it's too strong for me. Or I'm too far gone or I'll never be able to, or it's too late, or well, I'm just a weak person. When you say those things, because you believe the lie back there somewhere. These ideas may excuse your behavior, my behavior, but they don't justify your behavior, nor will they be acceptable when we are judged. Believe it or not, people who abandon the church because someone wasn't nice to them, for whatever reason, they may have a reason to have abandoned the church, but they have no justification. Jesus has told us, you know, you, you'll be stoned, you'll be chased from city to city, you'll be put in prison, you'll be accused of all kinds of things you know, because of me. And he says at the end, but if you remain faithful to the end, you guys who are suffering persecution, imprisonments, uh, martyrdom, blah, 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 if you remain faithful, you will be saved. Imagine, I don't see in that list uh, Sister Josephine, 
didn't send me a birthday card and I sent her a birthday card, therefore everyone, you know, people are hypocrites, therefore I'm leaving the church. I don't see that excuse there along the list that Jesus is, is using. If being persecuted is not an excuse for being unfaithful, certainly you getting crossways with somebody in the congregation is also not an excuse. Paul says that we can win over temptation, we can win over seduction and enthrallment. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you but such is common to man and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way to escape also so that you will be able to, notice he says, endure it. We're, also, we're always looking for the solution for God to take the thing away. And we think God hasn't answered our prayer if He hasn't taken the thing away. And yet Paul is not saying here, and God will be able to take it away. He just says, He will, be, he will give you the strength to endure it. That's the way out. My way out is God giving me the strength day by day to bear this burden, this thorn in the flesh, whatever it is, that's my way out. His help for me day by day, that's my way out. I may have to carry this thing all my life. When it comes to sin, Paul reminds us that we're not the first or only people in the world to have to deal with our particular sins. He also reminds us that God knows what our endurance limit is and He will not allow us to be tempted beyond that limit. He promises this. No more than what we can handle. Sometimes we're at the edge, but God promises He won't push us over the edge. And God Himself will provide you with a way to deal with every test and every temptation. Most of the times the problem is we won't use what He's given us. We want to do it our way instead of His way. John said, or he quotes Jesus here, he says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. If we realize that in Christ we are stronger than the evil one, stronger than temptation, we'll not be fooled into giving in and giving up when we're tempted or when we are discouraged. And then finally, in our spiritual battle with Satan, we must know the enemy, we said, know that we can win, and then finally, we need to know how to fight. Peter, who knew something about winning and losing battles with Satan, shows us how to fight him successfully. Number one, he says, humble yourselves before God. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time. Isn't it interesting? He's teaching us how to fight, and the very first thing, the very first strategy in how to fight, humble yourself. Humble yourself. We need to recognize that we are easily fooled, easily tempted, and we need God's help. We need His mercy every single day, because we're easy as a target. Number two, he says, bring your worries and fears to Him casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. One of the reasons we're, we're overwhelmed is because we try to fix or solve everything instead of giving them over to God and waiting patiently for His help. I repeat, waiting patiently for His help. We're in America. America is the land where we do stuff. We make stuff happen, right? If we do this, you know, we're trying to fix our economy, we're trying to do this, we're trying to, we're trying to control the weather, imagine. I won't even get into that debate, but you know, we're wanting to control the weather. We're trying to fix everything. And yet Peter says, if you want to fight certain, if you want to fight Satan, you have to learn how to be patient. Wait for his help, his help. We read the Old Testament stories of God you know, defeating Israel's enemies. Do you not realize that all those stories are for us too? For our enemies? That God will deal with on our behalf? Not just the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. He also says, remain alert, 
Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Again, he's not saying go to the gym and build up muscle, he just says pay attention. Pay attention. We fall into sin because we're careless. We don't listen. We're too busy consuming the world and becoming insensitive to spiritual matters. We lose our souls by neglect. Somebody asks, you know, why, why do we have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? It's not written in the Bible that we have to have Sunday night. Absolutely, it's not written in the Bible. It's not written in the Bible we have to have Wednesday night. Of course not, it's not written in the Bible. What's written in the Bible is that Satan wants to destroy our souls. <laughs> That's what's written in the Bible. And the more I recognize what a, what a wimpoid I am when it comes to battling with Satan, I need to be reminded once, twice, three times a week, four times, and pray three, four times a day, and read my Bible every day, and seek out Christians and people who are filled with the spirit with which I can yoke myself in friendship, in partnership, in business, in service. Why? Because Satan wants to kill me, that's why. And there's strength in numbers. That's why the wisdom of our leadership says, you know what? Maybe it'd be better if we had the sheep come together a couple of times a week that they might strengthen themselves. But what happens? We don't pay attention. The elders will stand up and say, we'd like you to do this, we'd like you to do that, we'd like you to, you know, for your own good. We don't pay attention attention. And you know what, I, I, it would be nice if I could say, you know what, I've been preaching this type of idea for years and I've been wrong. But I haven't been wrong. As much as I hate to admit it, I've been dead right. Because I've watched the carnage of broken marriages, broken family, broken lives. That Satan has destroyed to people that I love, people that I know, people that I've baptized, people that I've taught, and others. And how did he get to them? They just thought they knew better, that's all. They didn't pay attention. Peter says, stand firm, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Hold your ground, don't be moved, resist the pressure to change your faith, change your commitment to Christ, change your commitment to His church. Be of a mind that no matter what happens, you will remain faithful. This, defe this decision defeats Satan. There are things in my life that Satan tempts me with, and sometimes I got to talk to him. Not as a smarty aleck, but I talk to him as, an, as his adversary. And I say to him, it's no today, and it'll be no tomorrow, and it'll be no the day after, and it'll be no the day after that. You can keep trying, but the, it will always be no. My mind is made up on this thing. You can offer me the entire world. The answer is no. But is that what we do? No. We say, well, let me just take a little look. Let me look a little closer. Let me stick my head between the bars and take a closer look at that lion. Stand firm. It's no today, it's no tomorrow, and until the day I die on this matter, on this temptation, it's no. And then finally he says, Expect a reward. Expect a reward. After you have suffered for a little while, the why does he say a little while? Because if you live to be 80 years old, you, you don't have 80 years of suffering. You may have a couple of years of suffering. That's a little while. And that's a little while in comparison to eternal life. That's why he says a little while. You've suffered for a little while. The God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever, amen. What will He do? 
He's going to perfect me. He will confirm my position in Christ. He will give me the strength to say no tomorrow and no the day after and no the week after that. And He will establish me forever, He says, forever. You know, the great hope is that God Himself, not man, will reward you. He will complete your entire transformation into a being who is perfectly like His Son, Jesus Christ, and ready to share eternity with God without Satan, without temptation, without failure, without sin, without death. People say to me, what do you look forward the most for heaven? And my answer is always the same, no sin. No more sin in me. I will deal with God. I will have a relationship with God that is not based on my sins. And I will have a relationship with you not based on your sin and my sin. That's what, I don't know what the rest is going to be like. I don't know what the rest is going to be like, described in terms of gold and silver and diamonds and yeah, sure, I can't get my head around that. But I am absolutely positive that there's no sin in heaven. And I'm telling you, I cannot wait to be there because I'm so sick of my own sins and a little tired of yours, so. <laughs> in the end, every time we resist the evil one, every time we start over after failure, every time we pray to God for help and encouragement, it is, uh, it is with the ability and the abiding hope of this great reward set before us each day. I'm going to get something out of this. So I encourage each and every one of us here tonight to resist the evil one. And to resist the evil one every day. And I encourage you to look confidently into the future for the reward that will surely come. Resist every day, because he who has promised is faithful. Every promise, every promise has been delivered. There's only one left, and I look forward to it.